Lecture 5 is going to introduce us to maximum likelihood estimation. Last time we talked about point estimation, which was trying to form statistics to estimate our unknown parameters. And this time, uh, and last time I guess also we talked about our first method for estimating um, performing estimators, which is the method of moments. In method of moments, we basically form the set of equations um, based on moments and then solve those equations for the unknown parameter. Today, we're going to talk about maximum likelihood estimation, which is our second uh, technique to um, build up estimators. Um, and it's one of the more powerful techniques um, for building estimators has many nice properties. And um, after we talk about MLEs, as they're known, we'll then have multiple methods um, for constructing estimators. And we can start to talk about how we evaluate estimators and how we determine what a good estimator is and indeed what the best estimator is, if we can. So today's lecture is on maximum likelihood estimation. And um, we should start off by talking about what is called the likelihood function. The likelihood function is a function that is kind of central to many ideas in statistics. So this, this idea of a likelihood function is going to come up over and over again um, the more statistics you take. So our favorite setup again, is that I'm going to have a random sample from XNs, and they're going to be IID from some PDF theta. And this PDF is parameterized, sorry, PDF F, and this PDF is parameterized by some unknown parameter theta. And theta is going to live in some universe of possible thetas, capital theta. You tired of me saying that sentence yet? Uh, I sure am. So, if you recall from our first lecture, I think the first lecture, that if we have this setup, the joint distribution of our data uh, is the following, and we can denote that as f theta of x, and it is the product of the marginals. Each of the marginals, of course, um, is just f theta um, of some x sub n. So again, I'm abusing notation a little bit. I'm using f theta both to refer to the joint and the marginal. When it's the joint, I'm saying it's a function of x tilde, and when it's the marginal, it's a function of one of the x sub n's. It's a little bit abusive of notation, but it actually cuts down on how much notation we have to have. Um, so the end is probably probably a good thing. And so this was the joint distribution. And typically, we think of this as a function of um, our data, our x end, or of x tilde. Maybe we'll write that there. Okay, so typically we think of this joint distribution as a function of x tilde. I change my x tilde, I change my x sub n's, I get a different value for the joint distribution, which kind of in some sense either gives me the density or probability or the probability of observing my x sub n's. The likelihood function is basically viewing. Um, this joint distribution as a function of theta. So typically, up to this point, we've thought of the joint distribution as a function of um, the x's. The likelihood function is pretty much a rebranding of this joint distribution when we want to think of it instead of a function of the x's as a function of theta, right? Of course, theta lives in some set capital theta. We can vary theta and look at 
for a fixed set of x's how the um, how the value of this function changes. So let's write down the kind of two different ways of viewing this joint distribution. Two ways of thinking about the joint. joint. So the first way is the typical way where we think of it as f theta and it's a function from rn down to r. So this is our joint density function. And so you could draw our little picture. Um, I guess it doesn't have to be a normal distribution, but it's some distribution. And on my y-axis here, I will have f theta of, you know, x tilde. And then you could think of kind of my x-axis being x tilde. In reality, it's kind of a multi-dimensional space. And this is some surface over some multi-dimensional space. But for illustration, we can think of, um, think of it this way. And in this view, you know, if I pick some value of x tilde, I get some value of my joint density. I could change my value of x tilde. I get a different value of the joint density um, and so forth. So we're really thinking about if um, you know, the same function or the, this, this particular function up here as I change my x's. The second way of thinking about this function, which is the likelihood function, is thinking about it as um, a function of theta. So we'll call the likelihood function capital L for likelihood. And this is going to be a function from theta, capital theta, the space of all possible thetas I can have, to the real line. And it's going to be defined by L of theta is basically f theta of x. So it's no different. I mean, it's the same function, but by writing it in this way, we're thinking about it as a function from theta to r rather than a function of rn to r. And we can make kind of a similar plot. We could plot the likelihood function. So over here, we have f theta. Instead, we plot the likelihood function, um, and it will have some shape, maybe. Uh, it doesn't need to be the same shape, so maybe it looks like uh, that. And this is L. And here we're plotting on the x-axis theta and on the y-axis L of theta. And so this is just representing that we're thinking about, OK, if theta is 5, maybe we're there. If theta is 10, maybe we're here. If theta is 1, maybe we're here. But you're thinking about it this way as changing theta. How does f theta of x change versus the joint density way thinking about changing x and looking at how that construction changes. So in some ways, the likelihood function is nothing new. It's just a rebranding of the joint density. Often, it's useful, um, useful to consider the log likelihood function. likelihood function, what we're going to call the log likelihood function, which is literally going to be the log of the likelihood function. So we'll use little l of theta to refer to the log likelihood function. And it is literally log, it's supposed to be a g, log of l of theta. So here, when I write log, this means the natural logarithm. So you'll notice in, in advanced math courses, nobody writes ln for natural log. People just write log. It's understood. And here, so this little l, this is the log likelihood 
function. And we'll talk about why it's sometimes useful to consider the log of a likelihood function uh, pretty quickly, actually. Okay. So that's the likelihood function. Really, actually, nothing we didn't already know. And now that we have the likelihood function, we can give a definition of what a maximum likelihood estimator is. Maximum likelihood estimator. Almost always denoted MLE, because maximum likelihood estimator is a mouthful. And as the name implies, the idea behind the MLE is that we're going to choose, um, let me first say, what do we want to do? We want to estimate generically our unknown parameter theta. How are we going to estimate that? We're going to choose some estimator theta hat that gives the largest likelihood that is we are going to choose the estimator that gives the maximum likelihood hence maximum likelihood estimator mathematically we could write this um, theta hat of um, theta hat of, of, let's say, of x is going to be, so this is kind of the formula, right? This technically is an estimate, not an estimator, but if you plug in the random variable, it'd be an estimator, whatever. The point being is that theta hat, and often we'll write a little subscript MLE here. I might get lazy and stop writing that, but the, the estimator or estimate theta hat MLE is defined to be the argument data that maximizes the likelihood function. So that's, that's L of theta here. So arg max is the argument that maximizes L of theta. So I guess you could read the whole thing as the argument that maximizes L of theta. Technically, when we do this R max, we have to specify where theta lives. And it lives in whatever our kind of generic set of possible thetas is, capital theta. Um, so it's a little bit weird of notation, but the idea is pretty clear, basically. It's kind of like a calculus problem. I want to find the value of theta that maximizes um, that maximizes uh, the likelihood function. So let me just say one more thing about this argmax notation, right? Um, so let's just write aside max versus argmax. So just in case people haven't seen this before, if I have a function, and maybe my function looks like this, and uh, so it has a peak here, let's say at five, and the value when x is five is y is equal to seven. If this function is called f, then the maximum of f is, uh, we could say the maximum of f of x over my possible values of x is 7, right? The maximum value that 7, that f of x attains is 7, right? If I ask for the argmax, of f of x, I say, what is the argument, that is, what is, what is the value of x that gives me this maximum of 7? So what do I have to plug into f of x to get the maximum? 
and that would be five, right? So I have to plug in five to get the maximum. It is the argument I plug into f to get the maximum. It's the arg max. So that's a little bit of notation there. So backing up to our, our MLEs, theta hat MLE is the value of theta that maximizes the likelihood function, the arg max of L of theta. Okay. So I can maybe draw a picture pictorially, MLA pictorially. There's some function. Who knows what it looks like? I and mean, it doesn't have to look like anything particularly nice. Maybe it looks like that. And this is going to be L of theta. Here's theta. Now it gets L. And basically to find my MLA, I'm just going to go and try to figure out where oh, it looks like about here is my peak, right? So the corresponding value of theta on my theta axis or my x axis, this is what we would call theta hat MLE. Um, and there's a lot of different ways to find these MLEs. In this class, we're going to be giving you problems where you kind of get your, your hands dirty finding analytically. Um, but in many real world problems, um, it is, uh, you might have to find it numerically. You have to use optimization techniques. Um, so you could interpret something like a neural network as basically doing solving a really, really, really complicated um, maximum likelihood problem, trying to find the maximum likelihood estimator. Um, or any kind of many other machine learning algorithms. Um, I, I teach a course on statistical learning, and many statistical learning algorithms you can view as basically finding an MLE. And so they use optimization techniques to find the MLEs. Um, but in this course, we're working with simple enough problems that we can do it by hand, and that's definitely the best way to learn this stuff. So I said that we sometimes want to look at um, the log likelihood of function. And the question is, so why did I bring up this thing called the log likelihood function, which denotes as capital, or sorry, as lowercase l of theta. And the reason is that, first of all, well, so the reason is sometimes it's just easier to solve the problems if you work with the log likelihood. But uh, the kind of underlying fact is that the MLE is the maximum value that of, uh, is the value of theta that maximizes the likelihood, which is the same value that maximizes the log likelihood. So if I want to find my MLE, I can either maximize the likelihood function or I can maximize the log of likelihood function. They're the same. So I could write this out mathematically. I could say the arg max of capital L, the log likelihood function, is the same thing as the arg max of little l, the log likelihood function. So it doesn't matter which one I use. Sometimes one or the other is easier. Um, but in many problems, basically stemming from the fact that we often work with exponential families, not surprisingly, taking a log of the likelihood, we'll see, makes things easier. So why is is it sometimes easier, um, or why doesn't it matter, sorry, which we work with, right? Because log is an increasing function. So this looks like log of x. This is x, it's log. Basically, the answer is log is an increasing function. So indeed, I could replace the log with any other increasing function. Square root um, is an increasing function. I guess x squared is an increasing function. The reason we typically use log is if we work with exponential families, and taking a log makes the mathematics easy. But it's an increasing function. So if I have some value x1, 
and another value x2, then if x2 is bigger than x1, this means that log of x2 is bigger than log of x1, right? That's what it means to be an increasing function. And so correspondingly, um, <clears throat> we have that, right? So basically I could take logs of both sides and I preserve the greater than sign. If I have some MLE estimate, L of uh, theta hat, and I plug it into my likelihood function, by definition, L of the MLE is bigger than L of any other theta, or say bigger than or equal to, it's the maximum value. So L of theta hat is bigger than or equal to any other uh, L of theta. And so I could take the logs of both sides log of L of theta hat, which is by definition, the log likelihood of at theta hat is going to be bigger than or equal to little L of theta, which is, of course, the log of L of any other theta, right? It's just a complicated way of saying log is an increasing function, so it preserves, um, it, it preserves uh, inequalities. Okay, so let's just do some examples. And these are basically going to feel a lot like calculus problems um, because they kind of are, um, right? What we're going to be doing is we need to maximize a certain function. And we learned how to do that in calculus one or three. So let's look at an example. Let's assume I have some data from a normal distribution with a mean as unknown data and some variance. Um, and let's just fix the variance at one. Let's say the variance is known one, why not? And uh, we're gonna say that theta can be gone any, any, uh, any real number here. So the question I wanna answer is what is the MLE? theta. So let's do it. What do I need to do? First thing I need to do is I need to find uh, the likelihood function. L of theta or equivalently, you know, uh, equivalent log likelihood function, right? This is the function I need to maximize. Well, I better know what that function is. So let's look at, for this problem, what is L of theta? We said that L of theta is just a rebranding of F of F theta of X. And we know what F theta of X is, right? If our data is independent, which it is if it's a random sample, this is the product of the marginals. And in our case, our random variables x's are marginally normal theta one. So what's the PDF for that? One over root two pi exp negative one half xn minus, whoops, not mu, we're calling it theta, doesn't really matter. Okay. And let's just do some algebra to uh, simplify this a bit. So I have one over root two pi. I have that in n times my product. So I can write that as two pi to the negative n over two, right? Certainly one over root two pi is two pi to the negative one half. I have that n times multiplied. So that's to the, you can raise it to the nth power. And then I have exp and I have a bunch of products or a product of a bunch of exponentials. And so I can write that as the exponential of the sum. And if I do that, this is what I get, right? So basically what I'm, I'm taking advantage of here, and I've probably done this trip a 
trick a couple times. It's e to the a1 times e to the a2 dot 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 e to the an. So it's the product of exponentials is e to the a1 plus a2 plus a3 plus dot 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 plus an. Right. So um, and I've just consolidated some steps here. So some of these things I can pull to one half outside the sum, etc. So that's the likelihood function. Notice that my likelihood function, because I'm working with normal distribution, in fact, because I'm working with an exponential family, it takes the form of exp of something. And so now we start to see why looking at the log likelihood might make some sense. So let me take the natural log of this thing. So this is just the natural log of L of theta. And um, so what does that give me? If I have the log of a product, so I have the two things, I have this log of a two pi to the negative n over two, and the log of a product is the log of the sums, and I have log of exponential, those cancel out, and I'll be left with what is in the exponential, which is negative one half sum So we're left with that sum. And I can even simplify this a little bit more. Um, doesn't really matter, but I can always pull that exponent down, right? This would be negative n over two. In this case, it's not gonna make a big difference. Um, negative n over two times log two pi minus the remaining terms here. Okay. So that's my log likelihood function. And see, now I've gotten rid of my exponential, and so that makes me happy because um, I don't like exponentials. So what do I do? What am I trying to do, right? Recall here at this point that we're trying to get the MLE, which is the value of theta that maximizes, well, either capital L or the log likelihood function of theta. So I need to maximize this thing. How do I maximize something? Well, calc one says, if I find where the derivative is equal to zero, I can look at the kind of critical points and that probably is gonna give me my maximum as long as this function is nice enough. And this is not too bad of a function of theta. It's basically some quadratic in theta, All right? We have a squared. We have basically a theta squared. So my step two in many of these problems is take a derivative with respect to what? Not the x's, right? I'm trying to maximize over theta. So I need to take a derivative with respect to theta. So I'm gonna look at dl d theta now, when I take this derivative, negative n over 2 log 2 pi does not involve theta. That goes away. I'll be left with negative 1 half. I can push my derivative through the sum, because derivative is a linear operator. And I'll be left with the derivatives of these xn minus theta squared. A little chain rule will help me out here. I can bring down the 2. I can then say it's xn minus theta. And then I have to take the derivative of the inner part, which is just negative one, right? So it's just derivative with respect to theta. And, oh, that's nice. I have a negative two in that sum and a negative one half outside. And so what I'm left with is uh, this. Um, And we can expand this out. This is the sum of the x of n's minus, and I'll have n thetas, right? So I can basically distribute the sum across that difference there. That's totally allowed. And what does calc 1 say to do with my derivative? 
and I want to set it equal to zero, right? That's what you did in calc one. You took a derivative and you set it equal to zero. So I'm going to set my whole dl dt to zero, and I'm going to then solve for, for theta. And if I solve for theta, what I get is that n theta is equal to the sum of my xn's, or theta is equal to 1 over n times the sum of my xn's. There's a name for that called x bar. And this theta now probably is my MLE. Let's put a little hat over it and call it MLE, theta hat, MLE. So it looks like x bar is my MLE. Why do I say probably? Technically, in a Calc 1 class, what would you have to check? You have to check that my critical point is, is actually corresponds to a maximum, right? I could have a critical point corresponding to a minimum, or I could have a critical point corresponding to a maximum. And so what I need for it to be a maximum, I need two things. One, I need my function to be concave down. And I also probably need to check the endpoints of my interval. In this case, what's my interval? What's my possible values of theta? We said theta can be anywhere in R. So we'd have to check that you don't attain larger values at plus or minus infinity. That is, we have to check that the function that L of theta is not unbounded. It doesn't increase or decrease unboundedly. Um, so checking the second derivative is not too hard. So technically, we should check d squared L d theta squared. I mean, we're going to do it once. I'm not going to make you do this for every problem. It's a bit tedious, and, and frankly, it's not really that useful. Um, it is good to keep in mind that technically we should check these things. In our case, d squared L d theta squared. So if dL d theta is the sum minus n theta, it looks like if I take another derivative of that with respect to theta, that will just give me negative n. And that is always negative. So L is concave down, check mark, and you'd also have to check that, and I'm going to make a claim, and um, you can think about why this may or may not be true. Maybe I'll, I'll give a short justification. If you look at the limit as theta goes to plus or minus infinity, this log likelihood is, um, is going to go to zero. Why do I say that? Because um, if I look at, let's just look at the data, right? So the data is normally distributed. And um, if I look at my, my, my likelihood function, um, it's basically a quadratic in, in, in theta. I mean, it basically looks like, it looks like this thing. And as I go, kind of looks like this thing. Yeah, so it looks like um, this. Actually, the log likelihood, let me write this. This is more technical here. The likelihood goes to zero and correspondingly, the log likelihood um, will go to negative infinity as I go to zero, because it's going to look basically like this, uh, this concave down thing, where this, these are going to head off to negative infinity as I go, as I go too far from what we now know is the maximum here, which is basically x bar, right? What I'm basically claiming is that my log likelihood function looks like this. The peak here is attained at x bar, and as I go to positive and negative infinity on my theta axis, um, L, little l of theta, is going to go 
to negative infinity. Um, basically because this, this uh, log likelihood function looks like a negative quadratic in theta. You can think about that if, you, if you're bored on a Friday night, um, but it's true. So one time was we'll justify it. In the future, in kind of homework problems, just do the first derivative, find the critical point, z equal to zero, and solve for x bar. So anyways, I guess you know we kind of skipped over the, the punchline here, which is that, surprise, surprise, the MLE for normal data is x bar. So we've seen this several times now, um, where x bar shows up as, a, as the kind of natural estimator for the mean parameter of a normal distribution, which is great. That's kind of our intuition, which is, yeah, good. Um, that, that's what it should be. OK. So before we go on to other examples, there's a theorem, which I'm sure you will all be thrilled to learn. But it's kind of an interesting theorem, and it connects back to sufficiency. And the theorem is that MLEs are based off of um, sufficient statistics. Um, and we'll just say it that way. Um, typically, they are, they are going to be a sufficient statistic themselves. Um, but they're at least a function of a sufficient statistic. If that function is one-to-one, -one, they're sufficient themselves. Any one-to-one -one function of a sufficient statistic is a sufficient statistic. Um, anyways, um, but you could end up with non-sufficient statistics, blah, blah, blah. OK, so it's a little more complicated. That's basically the theorem uh, that theta hat MLE is some function, I just got, no, not call it f, is some function of t, and here t is going to be sufficient data. OK, so what's the proof of this? We could actually do a proof of this. And it's kind of a cute little proof. So by fact, the factorization theorem oh, I spell theorem. The factorization theorem says that if I look at my joint distribution of my data, if I have a sufficient statistic T, I can write this as some function involving the x's times some function g of theta t. All right, that's the factorization theorem in a nutshell. And of course, we know that the likelihood function l of theta is just a rebranding of this joint distribution. And furthermore, we know that our MLE, theta hat MLE, is is the arg max of l of theta so we can plug in what l of theta is it's h of x times g of theta t and i'm going to make a claim here that i don't care about h this is the same thing as the arg max of g of theta t. Why? We can ignore this because it um, doesn't depend on theta. All right? So as an aside here, you know, if I want to um, find the, uh, the if I want to find the argument that maximizes, let's say, x squared over 1 to 2, what is the argument that maximizes x squared over 1 to 2? That would be 2, right? If I look at the maximum of x squared, where x can range over 1 to 2, it's 4. 
Not very surprising. You can draw a little picture if you want. What if I multiply by something that doesn't depend on x? Let's add a 5 into this. So let's look at the argmax and the max of 5x squared. Well, the maximum, if it maximum before is 4, the new maximum is 5 times 4, right? Because now at 2, it's 4 times 5 is 20. The argmax is still 2 because the maximum of 5x squared is still attained at 2. And all argmax is saying is which of the x's attains the maximum. So back to our MLE, h of x doesn't depend on theta, and so it doesn't um, change the argmax to remove h of x. And that's basically the proof. All I'll say is that theta hat MLE is you can think of as arg. Um, of, as the argmax of g of theta t, and g of theta t is some function of t. If I change t, I'll get a potentially different argmax. Um, g is certainly a function of t, and so the maximum argument is presumably a function of t. Um, and that's all I was claiming. All I was claiming is that MLE is some function of t, and t is a sufficient statistic. So that's a cute little theorem, and it, and it relates things back, and it basically says in most cases that, that the MLE is going to be sufficient. It's going to be sufficient for, um, or at least a function of a sufficient statistic. All right, let's do some more examples, because um, that's what the homework's going to be like. So we should get some practice. Um, let's assume we have some data from a Bernoulli distribution. And the Bernoulli distribution is parameterized by probability P. And unlike the method of moments estimators, it's going to be kind of important here to specify the, the allowable values of the parameter. So you notice in the previous normal problem that said the, the mean can be any real number. Now I'm specifying that the the probability here can be between 0 and 1. Because the MLE, if we go back up to our definition, way back where, we choose the value that gives the largest likelihood. It's the R max over theta in whatever our set capital theta is. Now we could change that, and we will change it, and get potentially different MLEs. So you need to keep in mind the set you're maximizing over, because you could potentially restrict it and make some values of theta disallowed. Um, and that would change the value that maximizes it. So just what is the range you're maximizing over? Um, so that's kind of an integral part of, of MLEs. So um, in this case, we're just doing the typical problem where P could take on any of the you know, kind of real general values um, being zero and one. And what we want to answer is what is, let's say, P hat MLE. It's the MLE for P hat, or for P. So, two steps. One, two, two, two or so steps. Write L of theta, or equivalently, the log likelihood of theta. I guess in this case, we're not calling it theta, we're calling it P. So, L of P is just a rebranding of fp of x, right? p being our parameter. This is the joint distribution. The joint is the product of the marginals. And marginally, each of our xn's are Bernoulli. And so what is the pmf for the Bernoulli? It's p to the xn, 1 minus p to the 1 minus xn. So that's one way, right? So you can write Bernoulli distribution in a couple different ways. Um, sometimes people write it case-wise, um, where they say, you know, fx is, uh, you know, p or 1 minus p, it's p if x is equal to 1, it's 1 minus p if x is equal to 0, but you can write this in one line by saying it's p to the x times 1 minus p to the 1 minus x, right? If x is 0, it's 1 minus p, if x is 1, it's p. So this is this is an equivalent way to write the PMF. 
And that's important in this case because we're going to want to do some calculus on it. So we don't want to have cases because that's going to make calculus a whole thing. And then we need to do some tricks. So you'll, you'll be you're super familiar with these tricks, tricks by the end of the course, right? So I have a product of, of a bunch of things to a power. And so I can write that as p to the sum of the x of n's times 1 minus p. I can push that product through to the, in this case, it's the sum of the 1 minus x of n's. Uh, but we can write that as n minus the sum of the x of n's, right? That's allowable. And again, I'm using my little trick here that if I have the product of a to the bi over product over i, this is a to the sum of the b's sub i. So you learn these tricks as exponential, um, exponentiation, product, summation tricks, right? You, you can transform back and forth between them. And as before, this is, and maybe you can check this yourself, that this is a exponential family. Bernoulli is an exponential family. And so I can take the log of it and let's take the log. Now I'm going to skip some steps here. This is the sum of the x of n's times the log of p plus n minus the sum of the x of n's times log of 1 minus p. So the important rules to know about logarithms are what log of a, b is log of a plus log of b. If you become a statistician, we'll learn these kind of rules by heart from playing with these. Um, and the other rule is that log of a to the b is b times log of a. Okay. This is L of P. And so step two is we want to look at DL DP and set it equal to zero. That will give me a critical point. And if we solve for P, that will give me um, my maximum or my maximum likelihood estimator, as we call it in statistics. So let's calculate DL DP. Basically a Calc 1 problem, right? This is fun times. You can't have more fun than taking derivatives, can you? So log, okay, all right, it's not the, so one of the mistakes people often make is they try to take a derivative with respect to x. No, -uh. not the derivative with respect to x, the derivative with respect to p, the parameter, or theta, or mu. Don't take derivatives with respect to x's, wrong. So nice thing is anything involving x's is just some constant as far as the parameter is involved. So for example, the sum of the x's just stays the sum of the x's. Derivative of log of p is one over p. So we get the first part here, we get sum of the x's over p. n minus the sum of the x's is again constant with respect to the parameter. So we get n minus the sum of the x's. Log of one, so the derivative of log one minus p is, I believe we'll have a negative. So we'll change this to a negative over one minus p. And that's just going to be a chain rule application, right? It's 1 over p times the derivative of 1 minus p, negative 1, chain rule. And uh, what do we want to do with this? Set that equal to 0 and solve for p. Let's cross multiply. So if I cross multiply, this says 1 minus p times the sum of the x's minus p times n minus the sum of the x's. So you see I'm being a little lazier with my notation. That's still equal to zero. And let's just distribute our p's through. This is the sum. There's multiple ways to solve this. This is, uh, this is how I'm going to solve it. This is the sum of the x's minus p times the sum of the xn's minus p times n minus minus gives me a plus p times the sum of the xn's this is equal to zero anything cancel uh that probably cancels right minus p to the sum of the x's plus p times sum of the x's so finally what i get is i get 
and I can move this Pn to the other side is P times N. And P should be 1 over N times some of the Xn's. What's that called? X bar. So P hat, MLE, is X bar. Again, now technically, you know, if you're in Calc 1, you would have to say, well, okay, let's take a second derivative. God save your soul to take a second derivative of that thing. Maybe it's not so bad. You have to show it's negative, then you have to check the endpoints, check it zero, check it one. It's actually not so bad in this case. You could probably plug in zero and one. Um, it's a likelihood function. And yeah, you have to you, you check a bunch of things. I'm not going to require that in this course. Um, uh, it's it's going to be true of all these exponential families that this this argument is always going to work out. These things are always going to be concave down. Maybe we could prove that. I'll think about if we can show that proof. So that's the MLE. The MLE again is X bar. And let's think about that, what this MLE is. So I have a bunch of Bernoulli random variables. And I don't know, you know, so a bunch of coin flips, and I don't know what the probability of heads is. How do I estimate what the probability of heads is? Just flip it a bunch of times, and let's count the percentage of those times that it comes of heads. Seems like a good way to estimate what the probability of heads is. That's exactly what we're doing here, right? The Bernoulli are zero and ones. And so the sum of the of the zero and ones, the sum here is in my sample, the number of ones, and then I divide through by n, the total number of flips. So this is the percentage of ones. That seems like a reasonable estimate, or x bar is a reasonable estimate for the probability of getting a one. It's just the percentage of ones in my sample. So that's really nice that this MLE gives us, again, a really nice intuitive answer. And in general, MLEs make a lot of sense. And, uh, and generally, they're probably one of the better ways of forming estimates. And that's why they're used all over the place. So let's look at a variation on this problem. Um, this is a little bit more of an advanced problem, but it's not so bad. And it, it will we'll get to a really nice theorem. But I'm going to make you do some hard work to get to that theorem first. Um, and uh, so let's solve a little bit of a tedious problem. Just for fun, let's talk about the odds of something happening. So we're going to assume we live in the same world with these Bernoulli. And the Bernoulli distribution is parameterized by this parameter P, which is the probability of getting a success on my coin flip effectively, right? We could talk about odds instead, and the odds, maybe we'll call it eta, is statisticians consider the odds to be p over 1 minus p. It's the ratio of the probability of success over the probability of failure. Um, this comes from uh, betting odds. Betting odds is the number of ways to win to the number of ways to lose. Now, statisticians would call odds the the ratio p over 1 minus p, probability of success over probability of failure. OK. And if we notice here that I could solve this, let's just solve this for p in terms of, for, solve p in terms of eta, right? So eta is this function of p. Um, and we could solve this. 1 minus p eta would be p. Um, which would imply that, what, if I distribute that eta, eta minus eta p is p. Let's move the eta's, uh, sorry, let's move the p's all on one side. Eta is eta plus, sorry, eta is eta p plus p, or eta times 1 plus p. And, uh, Let's move eta back over. 
that's surely not right. What did I screw up here? Move that over. Yeah, I definitely can't do that. <laughs> um, I can factor out the P. Let's try that again. Eta is 1 plus eta times P. There we go. P is eta over 1 plus eta. Okay. All I did there is I wanted to solve for P in terms of eta. So we started off with eta as a function of P, and now we have P as a function of eta. Point being, this is a one-to-one -one function between eta and P. If you give me P, I can calculate eta using that formula. If you give me eta, I can calculate P given the second formula I just derived. So they're, they're one-to-one -one function. If I told you the probability of successes is something, you could certainly calculate eta. If I told you what the odds eta were, you could calculate the probability of success. So you could alternatively parameterize this Bernoulli distribution, not in terms of P, but in terms of eta. If I told you eta, um, it would tell you just as much as telling you P. So you can parameterize this in terms of a different parameter, eta. <clears throat> Another way of thinking about this is, what is the MLE for eta? Call it eta hat MLE. So I know that the MLE for p hat is x bar. What's the MLE for eta? So <clears throat> is there a trick here I can exploit, right? Well, the way that we found the MLE for p was we wrote the likelihood function in terms of p, and then we took the derivative with respect to p, set it equal to zero, we solve for p. And alternatively, we could write this all in terms of eta, take a derivative with respect to eta, set it equal to zero and solve for eta, and we get the MLE for eta. So we could, we could find this by reparameterizing, parameterizing in terms of eta. So instead of L of P, let's look at the likelihood for different values of eta, right? All the likelihood function is doing is it's telling me for different values of P, what's the likelihood um, of my data. So that's the likelihood function. If I give you a value of P equals to 0.25, what's the likelihood I saw my data? If I give you a value of P is equal to 0.75, what's the likelihood of my data? And I'm gonna pick the likelihood that is the, the value, the parameter that is most likely. Um, so that's the whole deal with MLE is picking the value of the parameter that is most likely to have been observed given what my data is, maximum likelihood. So I could do that again for P, but I can instead say, well, I want to look at all the different values of eta, and I want to figure out which value of eta is most likely given the data I observed. And so all, all you really have to do is you basically form a likelihood function for eta. And we can do that because eta is a one-to-one -one function of P. And um, so in this case, I could just replace P, right, in my likelihood function with it in terms of eta. So I could use this thing this nice function here. Every time I see a p in my likelihood function, I should replace it with eta over one plus eta. Then I get a function of eta, and I could play my calculus games with it. So let's just rewrite what the likelihood for p was. It is p to the sum of the x sub n's times one minus p to n minus the sum of the x sub n's. And so every time I see a p, I'm gonna replace it with eta over one plus eta. So my likelihood in terms of eta is going to be what? Eta of one plus eta to the sum of the x sub n's times one minus eta over one plus eta to the n minus the sum of my x sub n's, right? That's what I determined my likelihood function was. And um, I could get the log likelihood function for eta. That's gonna be the sum of the x sub n's times log of eta over one plus eta. 
and then I'm going to get again n minus the sum of the x sub n's times log of this thing. Um, notice here that 1 minus eta over 1 plus eta is 1 plus eta minus eta over 1 plus eta is 1 over 1 plus eta, right? So this is log of 1 over 1 plus eta. Just simplifying the, the, the algebra a bit here. So that's the log likelihood. Um, and we can maybe do some simplification here. What's our simplification going to be? So remember here that log of AB is equal, well, in this case, what we want is log of A over B is log, what's the rule? Log A minus log of B. Continue my calculation like this. So what we get is times log eta minus log one plus eta. That's in brackets there. Plus n minus the sum of the x bends. And uh, this is just going to be it's going to be what? It's going to be negative. Do this, right? I can bring a negative sign out here and flip my 1 plus eta in my logarithm. It's allowable. And I could actually distribute this log of 1 plus eta over. So this would be minus n log of 1 plus eta plus sum of the x sub n's times log 1 plus eta. A lot of algebra. It's worth it, though. I'll get to a great punchline, and you'll never have to do this tedious calculation again. OK, but this is high school algebra, right? OK, and I can distribute my first part, which is the sum of the x sub n's here, times log of eta minus the sum of the x sub n's times log of 1 plus eta. OK, all that to say that, let's try this again, that and that cancel. And so what I'm left with here, let's write it in black maybe, Sum of the x n's log of eta minus n log of 1 plus eta. Okay, what the hell are we even calculating? Log likelihood function of the odds, eta. So step two, so that was step one, right? Step one was basically get the likelihood function. Step two is say, d l d eta, set that equal to zero, solve for eta, right? So d l d eta is um, derivative of log of eta, one over eta minus n, and uh, derivative of log of one plus eta is one over one plus eta. We wanna set this equal to zero, cross multiply, 1 plus eta times the sum minus eta n is equal to 0. Keep doing some more algebra. The sum of the x sub n's um, plus, let's, let's move some, some terms to the other side, is equal to negative eta of the sum of the x sub n's plus eta n. Combining a couple steps there, I can, of course, factor out the eta. Um, right, I could factor the eta out, and it would be the sum of the x sub n's uh, plus, nope, let's write this the other way, n minus the sum of the x sub n's. Let's see if I messed up any algebra along the way. Um, And then, finally, we can solve in terms of eta. That is the sum of the x sub n's over n minus the sum of the x sub n's. <sighs> okay. So that's what we've solved for in terms of eta, right? And 
a kind of more useful step here. So you could call that a to hat the MLE for the odds. Let's multiply by one over n on the top and the bottom. Well, what does that give us? The top is now what we call x bar. One over n times n is one, and then we get x bar. So a to hat MLE, a kind of more useful form, more informative form, turns out is x bar over 1 minus x bar. Of course, let's notice a couple things. Remember that eta was p over 1 minus p. Recall that eta is p over 1 minus p. And p hat is x bar. Notice, eta hat is then p hat over 1 minus p hat. That's cool, right? It's kind of like terrifying and it's kind of annoying because what it is implying to us is that if I had derived my MLE for p, which was p hat MLE was x bar, and I wanted to get eta hat MLE. I said, actually, I don't want to know the, the, the MLE estimate for P. I want to know the MLE estimate for eta, for the odds. And so I had to do this whole long calculation. But it looks like I could have just taken the formula relating P to eta and plugged in P hat for P. And indeed, that's exactly the MLE estimator we get. The punchline after torturing you with algebra for a while, is that we can do this, this generally. If I want to get the MLE for a function of some other parameter, I can just plug it in. And so that theorem is basically known as the transformation function for MLEs, um, which we'll write out. We won't prove. Not, not too bad, it's, it's accessible, but it's a bit tedious. Um, so theorem, transformation for MLEs. And the theorem says that if theta hat is the MLE for some parameter theta, then um, for any function, oh, I don't know, let's call it tau, the MLE of tau of theta is tau of theta hat. So that's exactly what we want it to be. That is a super helpful fact. Because it means we can just solve the easiest one. Now, if I want a function of my MLE, or sorry, the MLE for a function of my parameter, I just need to apply that function to the MLE. Example. We had showed that if my data, my x sub n's, came from a normal theta one distribution, then the estimate for this mean, which I'm calling theta here, theta hat, the MLE estimate is X bar. Here is a test question. What is the MLE for, I don't know, Theta squared. Now, if I didn't tell you this theorem, that could be a really tough problem to solve. I know how to get the MLE for theta. That's just x bar. What's the MLE for theta squared? Easy. It is x bar squared. Super simple. And that's true of basically any function. 
any function we're ever going to come across, certainly, which is that if I want the MLE of a transformation of my parameter, I just transform the MLE. So let's just close with a real short discussion um, on interpretation of the MLE. I hinted at this a little bit in the lecture, which is that the MLE, which is the maximum likelihood estimator, is basically going to, so again, we look, it uses what's called the likelihood function. And um, sometimes people will write it like this, L of theta given X. Um, and this is maybe a little more to remind us that it's just a rebranding of the joint distribution, right? And so if I write the joint distribution as f theta of x, I'm reminded that um, it depends on not only my data, my x's, but it depends on my theta, my parameter. And so you could think of the likelihood function for a certain value of theta as the likelihood of observing um, my data if the parameter is theta. That is, another way you can say this is given that I observed some data, and generically we'll just call it x till, right? So I've seen some values, I've actually realized some values. I've seen the values 1, 3, 7, 2.4, right? I have a data set in hand. Given that I've observed this data, L of theta says how, quote, likely, not really a probability, it's kind of a likelihood, is what we call it, says how likely it is that this observed data came from a distribution with parameter data, right? So here I'm talking about a particular value of theta, right? So if I looked at L of one, given my data versus L of two, given my data, what this would be comparing is on the left here, we have the likelihood of observing my data, whatever it happens to be, one, three, seven, two point four, whatever, the likelihood of observing this data if my parameter, say generically, theta is one. And on the right here, we have kind of the same thing. The likelihood of observing my data if my parameter is two. And the maximum likelihood principle basically says if we're going to estimate which of these um, is more likely, how do we even say this without using the word likely? If we're going to choose which one of these two values of theta seems to fit my data better, I should choose the one that is more likely. And so I'm going to choose the oh, from these two, whichever one has a higher likelihood. And so in general, MLEs basically work on the principle of that we should estimate theta as the value um, that uh, the value of the my parameter uh, that is most likely given my data. And when you say it like that, it makes a lot of sense. All it's saying is that 
my estimate should be the value that uh, that is most consistent with the data I observed, right? You know, if I observe, you know, if my x tilde is, uh, if I'm assuming that my data, you know, come from some normal theta one distribution, so the mean is theta, my data is, you know, one, three, seven, two point four. I have the whole real line of possible values to choose from theta. But it's probably true that theta equal to 10,000 is unlikely. If I can spell that. But theta equals to, I don't know, well, what's the average of these? Something, you know, theta equal to, you know, I don't know, 4 is more likely. And so you should choose or prefer theta equals 4. And the whole procedure is basically just determine which of the which which theta is most consistent with the data, and that's all that is is maximizing that likelihood function. Okay, this is a good place to stop, um, but this is our introduction to MLEs, um, and so basically we went through a definition of a likelihood function, definition of MLEs. Um, we looked at some examples, and we looked at a super super useful theorem. Next time, we'll do some more examples. Um, we're doing more examples of MLEs next time.